Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the wonderful privilege of being in your house. We thank you for your word, which is a sure guide in a world of confusion and rebellion. And as we begin this series on the great apostasies of the Bible, we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit. I ask, Father, that you will give us clear minds and tender hearts so that we might understand and receive your word. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. The title of our study today is Four Steps to Ruin. Basically, we're going to study the story of Achan. But before we get to the story of Achan, I'd like to say that we are planning today to study the story of the pilgrimage of Israel from Egypt to Canaan. And four different ways in which Israel attempted to conquer Canaan. In fact, we're going to notice that the whole story of the pilgrimage of Israel from Egypt to Canaan is a type or an illustration of our pilgrimage from this world to heaven. Now as we begin, I would like to mention the four symbols of the story that we are going to deal with. First of all, we have Egypt. Egypt represents the world. And as Israel was baptized in the Red Sea, we have cut our connections with the world when we were baptized into Jesus. Canaan represents heaven, where we're marching to. In other words, we've left Egypt, the world, and we are on our way to the heavenly Canaan. But between Egypt and Canaan, there is a sojourn across the wilderness. There's a pilgrimage, and that represents our trek from the world to the heavenly kingdom. And finally there's Israel. Of course Israel represents us. Israel represents God's people. Now as I mentioned, we're going to study four ways in which Israel attempted to take the promised land. And it's going to illustrate four ways in which people react or which people believe they can actually make it to heaven. Now I would like to begin by going to the first method that, uh, and maybe I shouldn't even call it a method, I should call it the first illustration of the way in which one fails in attaining the kingdom or in attaining Canaan. Because we're going to notice that three of these methods are actually failures and only one of them is successful. So let's notice the first example of failure in attaining the kingdom. Numbers 13 and verses 30 to 33 tells the story of when Israel arrived at the borders of Kadesh Barnea, the borders of the promised land. They were about to enter the promised land. They had left Egypt, they had crossed the wilderness, and they were on the threshold of glory. But we know the story when they arrived there at the borders of the promised land, 12 spies were sent out, one for each tribe, and 10 of the spies brought back an evil report. And basically we're going to read the passage where we find the 10 spies saying that the enemies in Canaan were too powerful for Israel and they could not be overcome. And so we're going to notice that everybody decided that they would name a leader and they would go back to Canaan. In other words, they said, let's give up on the idea of going into Canaan because it is too difficult, the enemy is too powerful, the cities are walled all the way to the sky. Now notice what we find in Numbers chapter 13 and verse 30. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, and they were right, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. By the way, they were right. 
the Canaanites were stronger than they were. I continue reading. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. I must repeat that the people were right. They were too weak to overcome the Canaanites. The cities were too strong for them and the Canaanites were too powerful. And yet God had said that He would go with them and He would give them the victory. In fact the two spies who gave a good report and said that Israel could overcome the promised land and take it, Caleb and Joshua actually tried to encourage the people to take the land. Let's read Numbers 14 and verses 6 through 10 so we can catch the positive attitude of Caleb and Joshua, the two spies who brought back a good report. It says, but Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh who were among those who had spied out the land tore their clothes this is after the bad report and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel saying the land we have passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land if the Lord delights in us then he will bring us into this land and give it to us a land which flows with milk and honey only do not rebel against the Lord nor fear the people of the land for they are our bread their protection has departed from them and the Lord is with us do not fear them in other words the two spies Caleb and Joshua are saying we can overcome the giants in the promised land because God is with us but the people listen to the bad report the report of the majority and therefore this open rebellion against God and this desire to return back to Canaan led God to doom them to go and wander in the wilderness for a period of 40 years because they wanted to go back to Egypt instead of entering Canaan so the first attitude where individuals come to the borders of the promised land and they fail in taking the promised land is because they rebel against God they say the obstacles are too great the enemy is too powerful and by the, en by the way the enemies here represent the devil represent his angels represent the power of the world in other words we are too weak to take the promised land let's at least go back to Egypt and enjoy ourselves let's go back to the world and enjoy ourselves. But now we must go on to the second attitude. First attitude is simply open rebellion against God, going back to the world where we left and not persevering unto the end. The second attitude is illustrated by what Israel did after God doomed them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. We find the story in Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verses 41 to 46. After God told them that they were going to wander in the, prom in the wilderness for a period of 40 years, they decided that they would go and they would fight against the Canaanites. And the Bible tells us that they went, they went in their own strength, God was not with them, and they suffered a terrible defeat. Let's read about this in Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verses 41 to 46. Then you answered and said to me, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight, just as the Lord our God commanded us. And when every one of you had girded on his weapons of war, you were ready to go up into the mountain. And the Lord said to me, Tell them, Do not go up nor fight, for I am not among you 
lest you be defeated before your enemies. So I spoke to you, yet you would not listen, but rebelled against the command of the Lord, who pres and presumptuously went up into the mountain. And the Amorites who dwelt in that mountain came out against you, and chased you as bees do, and drove you back from Seir to Hormah. Then you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not listen to your voice, nor give ear to you. So the second attitude is let's take Canaan as our possession through our own efforts. Not necessarily by the help of the Lord, but through our own strength and through our own power. And the Bible tells us that when they thought that they could enter Canaan through their own efforts and through their own power, they failed miserably because God was not with them. And so we find illustrated here two different attitudes towards entering the land of Canaan or entering heaven in our case today. Number one is coming to the borders of the promised land and saying the enemy is too powerful, the world is too strong, we can't enter Canaan, it's not any use to even try. And so we turn around and we go back to Egypt, we go back to the world where we came from, and we live the worldly lifestyle because we feel it's too great of an effort to enter the promised land. The second method is to try and enter heaven or take the promised land through our own efforts. And that also is a terrible failure. But there's a third attitude towards taking the promised land. And this is the one that I want to dwell on, especially in our study today. And that is that we can overcome the enemy and we can take the promised land or we can enter heaven while we cherish our own favorite little sins. In other words, we can enter heaven in sin. Now here's where we come to this very interesting story of Achan. It's a story which is recorded in uh, Joshua chapters 6 and 7. And I'd like to say, first of all, before we go into study this story, that Jesus had met Joshua outside of Jericho. This is recorded in Joshua chapter 5 and verses 13 through 15. And uh, Joshua had asked uh, the um, prince of the host of the Lord, who is Jesus, are you with us or are you with our enemies? And the prince of the Lord's host said, no, I am come as the prince of the Lord's host. And then he told Joshua to take his shoes off because where he was, was holy ground. And the Bible tells us that Joshua also knelt before this being. So it was Jesus. Jesus had actually come down to help Israel in their fight against Jericho so that they could take the promised land. The Bible tells us that they went against Jericho and we know the story. Uh, through the power and help of the Lord uh, the city walls crumbled, the city fell to the ground and Israel conquered this first city of the promised land. And so they said, wow, this is going to be quite easy all we do is march around the city and suddenly the walls crumble and the city falls to the ground. And so they say, let's go now and fight the next city. And so they went to a city called Ai. And they suffered a terrible defeat. Why had they suffered such a signal victory when they had gone into Jericho and now they suffered such a terrible defeat when they went against Ai? The reason is that there was an anathema among the people. Someone who was cherishing sin which made it impossible for Israel to enter the promised land. They could not stand before their enemies. Let's read in Joshua chapter 7 and beginning with verse 10 the story of the sad story I might say of what happened. It says there in Joshua 7 and verse 10 So the Lord said to Joshua Get up! Why do you lie thus on your face? Because he was crying. Now notice this I, actually Israel has sinned 
I want you to notice that. Israel has sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived. And they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies but turned their backs before their enemies because they have become doomed to destruction neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Now I don't know, I don't know if you noticed here the number of times that God says they, they, they referring to Israel actually the Bible tells us that it was Achan that took these things, of course some of his family members knew about it but all of Israel had not taken things from Jericho because God had said don't take anything from Jericho so what is God saying by uh, blaming all of Israel for what Achan had done? you see folks sin is a corporate affair sin in the church is not an individual thing. A little leaven actually causes the whole lump to rise. A little sin leavens the totality of the church. There is no such thing as individual sin. And of course we know when an individual develops cancer in his or her body that unless you cut out the cancer, the cancer will take over the whole body. And that's exactly what would happen with Israel if Israel did not take care of this problem of an individual and his family cherishing sin and still think that they could take Canaan as their possession, that they could enter the land of Canaan. Allow me to read you a statement that we find in the book Conflict and Courage, page 120. This is a statement from Ellen White where she says that sin is a corporate affair when an individual in the church is cherishing sin it leads to the defeat of the total congregation she says this the history of Achan teaches the solemn lesson that for one man's sin the displeasure of God will rest upon a people or a nation till the transgression is searched out and punished sin is corrupting in its nature one man infected with its deadly leprosy may communicate the taint to thousands. Those who occupy responsible positions as guardians of the people are false to their trust if they do not faithfully search out and reprove sin. And so God told Joshua you must cleanse this evil from Israel. Now there were two ways in which this evil could be cleansed so that the people could take the promised land as their possession. The first way would be if Achan confessed his sin I believe that God would have forgiven Achan. But there was another way and that is that if he didn't confess his sin ultimately his sin would destroy him. Notice what we find in Joshua chapter 7 and verse 13 we're going to notice the process that God followed in this situation with Achan. It says there in Joshua 7 and verse 13, Get up, God is speaking to Joshua, sanctify the people, and say, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow. Because thus says the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. And as I mentioned there were two ways, two possible ways of taking away the accursed thing. That would be number one for him to confess his sin and to repent of his sin or the other way is to make sure that your sin will find you out. Now it's interesting to notice the process that God followed. God gave Achan at least six calls. God was saying I know where you're at. I want you to repent. I want you to confess your sin. First of all, Achan had seen the defeat of Israel at the hands of the people of Ai. He knew that they had been defeated because of his cherished sin in the congregation. Secondly, 
He had heard the announcement that Joshua had made to the congregation that the next day the transgressor was going to be found among the congregation. And yet in neither of these two cases did he step forward and say, I am the guilty party. God gave him actually four other calls. Notice Joshua chapter 7 and verse 14 the process that was followed in identifying the transgressor. It says there in Joshua 7 14 In the morning therefore you shall be brought according to your tribes and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to the families and the family which the Lord takes shall come by households and the household which the Lord takes shall come man by man. Now the question is why did God follow this process of choosing the tribe, then choosing the family, then choosing the household, and then choosing among men? The fact is that God was saying to Achan, I know which tribe you are in, I know which household you are in, I know which family you are in, and I know who you are, and I know where you're at. And so God through this process was actually calling Achan to confess his sin and to show sorrow for sin. You know God knew where he was. God could have told Joshua, hey go to Achan's tent. He's the one that stole this stuff. Go take him outside the camp and burn him. By the way the Bible says that he was stoned and then he was burned. That's a very interesting uh, judgment. Uh, we'll notice a little bit later on. Now notice Joshua chapter 7 and verse 15. Then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. And so then God follows the process identifying the transgressor, the one who was hanging on to sin and cherishing sin. Do you know that the Spirit of Prophecy says that one sin cherished will annul all the power of the gospel? And it will definitely keep you out of victory over the enemies and it will keep you out of heaven. That's what God is trying to illustrate here. You see, it does no good for us to rebel against the will of the Lord and go back to the world. That's the first attitude. It does no good for us to try to enter heaven through our own efforts. It's impossible. But equally as serious is the idea that you can enter Canaan and overcome the enemies so that you can take over Canaan and at the same time cherish your favorite sins. Now I want you to notice how the process is described in Joshua 7 verse 16 and we're going to read through verse 18. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes and the tribe of Judah was taken. That was Achan's tribe by the way. He brought the clan of Judah and he took the family of the Zarites. And he brought the family of the Zarites man by man and Zabdi was taken. Then he brought his household man by man and Achan the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was taken. You see the calls had run out. He had seen the defeat of Israel. He had heard the announcement that the next day the transgressor was going to be found. He had seen the tribe chosen. He had seen the family chosen. He had seen the household chosen. He had seen the men brought there for the transgressor to be chosen. And yet he chose to hang on to his sin. When he is discovered we find that Joshua has some very clear and direct counsel for Achan. Notice Joshua chapter 7 and verse 19. Now Joshua said to Achan, My son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession to Him, and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And then in the very next verse we find Achan admitting his sin. Did you hear the word that I used? I did not say 
that he confessed his sin I said that Achan admitted his sin it's different to, confe uh, to confess your sin than it is to admit your sin notice verse 20 and Achan answered Joshua and said indeed I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel and this is what I have done and then he describes exactly what he had done we're going to study that in a few moments you know it's kind of like a child who gets caught with his hand in the cookie jar you know and then when mom comes and discovers that he's had his hand in the cookie jar when mom has said don't you dare eat any of the cookies the child says oh I'm sorry mom I'm sorry but he's not really sorry that he disobeyed mom and took cookies out of the jar he's sorry because of the punishment that he knows is coming and that was the type of repentance if you can call it repentance of Achan it was an admission of guilt but it was not a confession of guilt notice how Ellen White describes this uh, admission on the part of Achan Conflict and Courage page 121 she says Achan acknowledged his guilt but it, when, it, when it was too late for the confession to benefit himself he had seen the armies of Israel return from Ai defeated and disheartened yet he did not come forward and confess his sin he had seen Joshua and the elders of Israel bowed down to the earth in grief too great for words had he then made confession he would have given some proof of true penitence but he kept, he still kept silence he had listened to the proclamation that a great crime had been committed and had even heard its character definitely stated but his lips were sealed then came the solemn investigation how his soul thrilled with terror as he saw his tribe pointed out then his family and his household but still he uttered no confession until the finger of God was placed upon him then when his sin could no longer be concealed he admitted the truth how often are similar confessions made there is a vast difference between admitting facts after they have been proved and confessing sins known only to ourselves and to God that is a remarkable statement now what I want us to notice is that Achan's sin followed a four step process and this will teach us a great lesson for us because we're also marching to Zion, we're marching to Canaan we have enemies to overcome in order to enter Canaan it does no good for us to return to the world in rebellion against God that's not going to save us it does no good for us to try to enter Canaan through our own efforts Israel was defeated in that method it does no good for us to hang on to our cherished sins because we will not be able to stand before our enemies we can't take Canaan and when we notice that Achan's sin followed a four step process we learn many lessons that will be valuable for us notice Joshua 7 and verse 21 and hoping you'll, I hope you'll underline four key words that we have here notice when I saw, Achan says, that's the word I want you to underline when I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weigh, weighing 50 shekels notice that we're told that Achan saw those things now let me ask you, was it a sin to see those things? of course not, because all Israel was seeing those things you see there's a difference between temptation and sin temptation is when something momentarily crosses our mind sin is when you allow that to lodge in your mind and it becomes an obsession and then you take action you know Martin Luther was very wise when he said you can't keep the birds from flying over your head but you can keep them from making a nest in your hair we can't keep temptations from flying through our minds but we can keep those temptations from lodging in our brain and then becoming sin and thought 
in thought and then eventually sin in action. So the first step was that Achan saw. No sin in seeing, but the problem is if you continue seeing and you continue looking then you have the second step that leads to ruin. Notice Joshua 7 and verse 21 continuing after saying that he saw it says there I coveted them. You know at Seventh-day Adventists we emphasize a lot that sin is wrong action. But do you know that sin before it becomes a wrong action it involves wrong thinking. In other words sin has its origin in the mind. Sin has its origin in the brain and then it produces fruit in action. And so Achan says, I saw these things and then I what? I coveted them. That is I desired them. Notice that he sinned before he took these things. Because Jesus said that covetousness for example is breaking the seventh commandment in Matthew chapter 5. In other words whoever looks upon a woman to covet her has already committed adultery in his heart Jesus says even before the action. And that's the reason why David was very wise uh, when the Holy Spirit uh, inspired him to write Psalm 119 where he says, Thy law have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. You see, we need to build barriers against sin in our minds. Because sin does not originate in action, sin originates in the mind. Sin is first of all wrong thinking, not wrong acting. If you're going to overcome sin it must be overcome in the level of the thinking processes first. But now notice the third step of Achan's sin. Joshua 7 and verse 21. I'm just going to read the phrase. He says, and took them. Now do you, know the, do you notice the process here? He says, I saw these things. Then he says, I desired or I coveted these things. In other words, I, you know, I sinned in my mind is basically what he's saying. Because the 10th commandment says, Thou shalt not what? Thou shalt not covet. And then when he covets these things, what does he do? He takes them. Action follows thoughts. In other words, the wrong thinking led to wrong action. And as Adventists, we need to emphasize that sin begins in the brain. You know we might not even commit the bad acts but if we have the wrong thoughts it's still sin according to scripture. And then I want you to notice the fourth step. Achan continues saying there in verse 21 and there they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. So what is the fourth step? trying to hide what he had done. I saw, I coveted, I took, and I hid. That reminds me of that verse in Proverbs 28 and verse 13 where the wise man Solomon said, He who covers his sins will not prosper. And this is an illustration in the story of Achan. But who ever confesses and forsakes them will have what? Will have mercy. By the way, do you know what made Achan's sin so particularly offensive to God? It's simply because Jericho was God's tithe of the land. Did you realize that Jericho was God's tithe of the land? It was the first city that Israel conquered. And God said, don't you take any of the gold, any of the silver, any of the bronze, that all needs to be dedicated to the sanctuary. And so Achan, what he did was he actually stole God's tithe. Notice Joshua chapter 6 and verse 19. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Notice Joshua 6 and verse 24. 
but they burned the city and all that was in it with fire only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord in other words Achan in a very real sense stole the tithe is that a problem in the church today? would something like that keep us out of the heavenly Canaan? it's food for thought the Bible says thou shalt not steal, it doesn't say thou shalt not steal from man it says thou shalt not steal, if it's serious to steal from men how much more serious to steal from God? is it just possible that this is one of those cherished sins that does not allow the church to overcome the enemies that it might take the heavenly Canaan as its possession? allow me to read Ellen White's comment on this issue of, of the tithe as it applies to the story of Achan. Volume 3 of the Testimonies, page 268. The captain of the Lord's host had led the armies of heaven. The battle was the Lord's. It was He who fought the battle. The children of Israel did not strike a blow. The victory and glory were the Lord's, and the spoils were His. He directed all to be consumed except the gold and silver which he reserved for his treasury. Achan understood well the reserve made and that the treasures of gold and silver which he coveted were the Lord's. He stole from God's treasury for his own benefit. Powerful statement. You know there are other stories in scripture that illustrate the same four steps to perdition. You have the story of the sin of Eve in the Garden of Eden. Let's notice Genesis chapter 3 and verses 6 and then we'll jump down to verse 8. Genesis 3 verses 6 and 8. Uh, tell me if you find the same four words that we notice in the, in the story of Achan. It says there in Genesis 3 verse 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree what? desirable, did she desire it first before she took? yes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she what? there it is, she took of its fruit and ate, she also gave to her husband with her and he ate and then let's go to verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife what? there it is, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. You could say the same thing about the sin of David, I could give you a biblical example after biblical example of the four step process that leads to sin. You remember David, the Bible says that in uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11 that it was the time when the kings of Israel should have gone out to war and instead of going out to war, instead of being busy the idle mind is the devil's workshop and so David instead of being out fighting the battles of the Lord he was nice and comfortable in the palace and he walks out one day onto the balcony and he sees this beautiful woman bathing naked and if you read the story there in 2 Samuel chapter 11 you'll discover the very same four words as in the story of Achan and as, as in the story of Eve's sin the Bible says that David saw this woman then the story says that David coveted this woman, let me ask you was it a sin for David to see this woman? no, he went on the balcony you know he looks out and he sees this woman, listen you'd have to run around, you have to walk around with your eyes blindfolded in order not to see, but even then you would have troubles because you would have your, the eyes of your brain you know it didn't help for monks to go into monasteries because they took their sinful brain with them but anyway you know David saw what he should have done, see that's where you overcome sin is at the first step, at the temptation, he should have turned and said I look no more, but instead of doing that it says there in 2 Samuel 11 that he coveted her, and then the word took her is used, and then did he try to hide his sin, he most surely certainly did, and he tried to do it by killing imagine that by killing his trusted general Uriah the Hittite unbelievable 
the results that sin leads to when you cherish sin in your life. And so folks we cannot enter heaven, the heavenly Canaan, by our own efforts. It does us no good to turn around and say, oh I better go back and enjoy the world anyway, because it's too difficult to enter heaven. It requires too much effort. The enemy is too powerful. It does us no good to hang on to sin, thinking that we can have heaven, we can overcome the enemies, we can enter the promised land while we cherish our sins. The question is then, how can we take Canaan as our possession. Well, in the story of the conquest of Jericho we have the secret. It was actually a combination of divine power and human obedience. Divine power combined with human effort. God had said to Israel, I want you to go and I want you to march around the city of Jericho once a day, seven times on the seventh day, and I'm going to take care of the rest. All you have to do is march around, blow your trumpets, shout, and the city's going to fall. Now Israel could have said that's the most ridiculous thing that we've ever heard in our lives. You don't conquer a city by blowing your trumpets and by shouting and marching around it. In fact, the people inside, many of them must have thought that the Israelites were fools. That's not the way you do battle. But God said, you know, could God have made that walls of the city crumble without Israel marching around and blowing their trumpets and shouting? Of course He could have. But God wanted them to show obedience and then He kicked in with His divine power and gave them the victory over the enemy. In other words, victory, victory over the enemy, taking Canaan, means trusting in God enough loving God enough to do what God tells us to do and He will give us power to overcome the enemies and the obstacles no matter how large they are. It reminds me of the story of Israel next to the Red Sea in Exodus 14 the Egyptians were coming with 600 of their choice chariots with their armies to defeat Israel. Israel was, was caught in. They had no escape. The sea was in front of them. Mountains on one side. Desert on the other. The Egyptians behind them. It looked like they were going to be defeated. God didn't say, you know, you guys need to, you need to go out and you need to fight. You know what the Lord said? He said, be still and see the salvation of the Lord. But do you know what Israel had to do? To show that they believed in the salvation of the Lord? The story tells us that Moses extended his rod and the people had to walk into the waters actually before the waters opened. They had to show their faith and trust that God was going to do what He said He was going to do. They actually got their feet wet and then God opened the Red Sea. We can find this same principle of the combination of divine power and human effort in the story of David and Goliath. In every biblical story you find this. Let me ask you, could God have caused Goliath to have a heart attack? Of course He could have. Could God have defeated Goliath in many ways doing it all by Himself? Of course. But He said to David, I'm going to give you the victory over this giant. Even though he's, uh, he's about 12 foot, feet tall you know, and you're just a little short kid, I'm going to give you the victory. So what does David do? Say, I'm going to sit down and watch you Lord. That's not what David does. David actually goes down and he picks up five stones. Some people think it's five stones because there were five cities uh, in the uh, Philistine Pentapolis. Other people believe that it was because Goliath had five brothers. We don't exactly know the reason why, but, but David went and he got five stones and he obeyed the Lord. He whirled his, his uh, slingshot and he threw the stone and guess what God did? God guided the stone into the only vulnerable place that was available, the forehead of Goliath. In fact it says that the stone had so much force, force that it encrusted itself in the forehead of Goliath. And by the way when he fell he wasn't dead. Because the Bible says that David then went with his sword, with Goliath's sword, and David killed him. 
So once again the idea of divine power combined with human effort. The devil cannot defeat God's people if they use this wonderful formula. It makes me remember the story of the triple alliance that had come against Israel. This story is told in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And Israel was shaking. And so God gives some counsel to Jehoshaphat. Let me read you from uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verses 15 and 16. And he said, Listen all you of Judah, this is a prophet. Listen all of you of Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude for the battle is not yours but God's. And so what does God tell Israel? Sit down and see the salvation of the Lord. That's not what He tells them to do. Notice what we find in chapter 20 and beginning with verse 24. So they rose early in the morning. Notice that they obeyed the Lord. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Je Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe His prophets, and you shall prosper. And it was a prophet who had said, Go out against them. And they obeyed the voice of the prophet. And now notice verse 21. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord. And who should praise the beauty of His holiness. As they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord for His mercy endures forever. See, God told them, go out and sing. They had something to do. We find in verse 22, Now when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, to, to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. So when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were dead bodies fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. See once again this idea, you know, we're going to enter the heavenly Canaan by cooperating with God. It doesn't mean that we work and God saves us. It means that God saves us, we trust in Him, therefore we obey Him, and we overcome the enemies. Now notice Philippians chapter 2 and verses 12 through 14. Philippians chapter 2 and actually verses 12 and 13. Here the Apostle Paul explains this process. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, notice this, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Who works out the salvation? It says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You say, that's righteousness by works. But then you have to read the next verse. In the next verse it says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. Do you see the principle illustrated in this passage? Very clearly, the Lord tells us, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But then he says, it is God who what? It is God who works in you both to will and to do His good pleasure. You know, God had tried to teach Israel this lesson. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 22. Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 22. God had warned Israel when they entered the promised land that they were going to meet these powerful giants. And that the cities were going to be walled to the heavens. God had warned them that this is what Canaan was going to be like. But God had also told them, don't be afraid of them. Because I'm more powerful than they are. Notice Deuteronomy 3 and verse 22. You must not fear them. 
For the Lord your God Himself fights for you. There you have in a nutshell the principle that I'm trying to share with you. The secret of victory over the enemies so that we can enter the heavenly Canaan. It means trusting in the Lord and allowing the Lord to fight our battles through us. Notice what the Apostle Paul has to say in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. There the Apostle Paul says this, and you've heard this verse before. He says, I can do most things through Christ who strengthens me. That, oh, that's not what it says. That's the Steve Bohr 21st century version. Okay, let's try again. I can do some things through Christ who strengthens me. That's not what the text says. The text says, I can do all things except overcome sin through Christ who strengthens me. That's not what the text says. You know, when people say, it's impossible to overcome sin because you have a sinful nature and the sinful nature is too powerful and you're going to be sinning all the way into the heavenly Canaan. When they say that, they're really saying that the flesh is more powerful than God is. They don't think of it this way, but if you say that it's impossible to overcome sin before we enter heaven, you're saying that it is impossible for God, that God is not powerful enough to give us the victory over sin, that the flesh and the world and the devil are more powerful than God is. Let's not limit the power of God. Now I'd like to read a statement as we draw this to a close. This is a marvelous statement. It's found in Christ's Object Lessons, pages 3, actually page 333. Page 333 of Christ's Object Lessons. And actually, you know, uh, it would be good if you read um, pages 331 to 333. There's a lot of material that comes before this statement, but I'm only going to read this excerpt from page 333. That should be easy to remember, right? 333. Half of the number of the beast. How about that? You'll never forget it now. Christ's Object Lessons, 333. This is what Ellen White has to say. As the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. What does omnipotent mean? It means that you can do everything. It means you can do all. What happens when the will of man cooperates with the will of God? The will of man becomes what? Omnipotent. She continues saying, whatever is to be done at His command may be accomplished in His strength. I love that. Once again, whatever is to be done at His command may be accomplished in His strength. In other words, God tells us what, he, what to do, and then He gives us the strength to do it. She ends the statement by saying, all His biddings are enablings. In other words, everything that He bids us to do, He also gives us the resources to do. You know, coming back to the issue of the tithe, some people say, Pastor, you know I can't return the tithe. I just don't have enough money. You know, after I pay all of my bills, there's nothing left. You know, I can give you a formula where you'll always have enough, uh, enough money to pay your tithe, that is pay it first, or return it first. You'll always have enough if you return it first. Oh, but then I'll have the creditors come and foreclose my home. Well, let me ask you, what would be better, to have your home foreclosed or to steal from God? Probably it would be best for us not to get into debt on our credit cards and have good stewardship principles. Then we wouldn't have troubles taking the tithe and giving the tithe and also paying the rest of our bills. What I'm saying is that when God tells us, you know, return a faithful tithe, He's going to make it possible for us to return a faithful tithe. When God says, keep the Sabbath, you know, people say, well, but what I'm going to do? I have to work on Sabbath. They're not going to give me Sabbath off at my job. So what you're saying is God is telling you to do something and He's not going to give you the resources to accomplish it. The fact is God says, 
in His Word He says, if you love me, trust me enough to keep my Sabbath. And if you keep my Sabbath, I'm not going to leave you out to dry. I am going to come and I'm going to either allow you to keep your job or else I am going to make it possible for you to find a job that is better than the one that you have. But we have to step out in faith and we have to obey God because we love God. So we find in our study today four ways of approaching Canaan. Heaven. We've left Egypt. We're on our pilgrimage across the desert of this world to the heavenly Canaan. The enemies are the devil and his angels, the world, the flesh. They're powerful. And there are four ways in which we can approach this. We can either one, say the enemies are too powerful, I give up, I'm going to go back and have fun in the world. The second one, the second way of approaching it is saying, hey, I can take Canaan by my own efforts, by my own works, I can make it to heaven. It's an impossibility. The third is by reaching the borders of Canaan and thinking that we can enter Canaan and take possession of the promised land by cherishing sin in our lives. And the fourth is the true and only way and that is by cooperating with divine power to overcome the enemy in our lives.